Hey, welcome back to the YouTube channel for the Renaissance English History Podcast. I am your host, Heather, and I have been podcasting on Tudor England since 2009, the original Tudor History Podcast. This channel is where I put all of my episodes from all of my shows, as well as lots of extra content like this video right here. Today, we are going to talk about the men who were at the center of Anne Boleyn's court in the summer of 1535, these halcyon days before everything fell apart for Anne, when her, her court was this hub of poetry, of music, of courtly love. And we're going to talk about the men whose names we will recognize, because later on they would, of course, be part of Anne's downfall. But we're going to talk about who these men were and what they were doing at Anne's court. If you would like to get more Tudor history in your YouTube feed, Make sure you hit subscribe right now so you never miss an episode or video that I put out. All right. The summer of 1535 was a time of vibrant activity in the Tudor court. Anne Boleyn was firmly established as queen. She was the center of a dynamic and ambitious circle of women and men. We're going to talk about the men today. It was a period of relative stability marked by courtly entertainments, by political maneuvering and cultural exchanges. At this moment in time, Anne still wielded considerable influence, not only over Henry VIII, but also among courtiers who were eager to be part of her inner circle. So we're going to take a look at the men who filled Anne's court that summer, providing a snapshot of this moment in time, this lively, complex environment around Anne. Starting with George Boleyn, her brother, one of the most important figures at the court. He was a skilled diplomat. He was actively engaged in both political negotiations as well as cultural discussions. Fluent in French and well-read in classical literature, George was known for his sharp wit, his intelligence, making him a favorite in intellectual circles that Anne encouraged. His diplomatic missions often brought him into close contact with foreign envoys, where he represented Anne's interest as much as the king's. George's presence at court wasn't just political. He was also a regular in Anne's chambers, often joining her for poetry readings and private discussions. This would come back to haunt him later. His reputation for charm and his skill in poetry further cemented his position as a key figure in the cultural ambiance of Anne's court. In the summer of 1535, George was more than a brother to a queen. He was a central player in her circle. Then there was Henry Norris, the king's chief gentleman and close confidant. Henry Norris held one of the most trusted positions in the royal household as the king's chief gentleman of the privy chamber. This role placed him in close proximity to both Henry and Anne Boleyn, serving as a vital channel of communication between them. By the summer of 1535, Norris was a familiar presence at court event often accompanying the king on hunts and tournaments. His involvement in court life extended beyond just his duties. He was deeply enmeshed in the social fabric of the Tudor elite. Norris's relationship with Anne was one of mutual respect. Anne often sought his counsel on matters both personal and political. His loyalty to Anne was evident in the casual familiarity that they shared, whether royal banquets, or informal gatherings in Anne's chambers. That summer, Norris epitomized the trusted inner circle of Anne's court, a man of confidence and closeness. Francis Weston was one of the most spirited courtiers in Anne's circle. He was younger. He was only about 24, 25 at this time. His youthful energy combined with his talent for dancing, gambling, and sports made him a popular figure among the nobility and the ladies of the nobility. Weston was often seen at the royal tennis courts or engaging in games of bowls, where he demonstrated both his skill and his playful competitiveness that endeared him to his peers. His charm wasn't just limited to the court's playing fields. He was also a regular presence at Anne's more intimate gatherings, where his quick wit and easygoing nature made him a favorite. Mark Smeaton was one of the few non-noblemen who had regular access to Anne's private chambers. He was also younger, he was about 23 or 24, and he was a talented musician 
summoned to play the virginals or loot for and and her guests. His performances added a softer, cultural touch to Anne's court, offering a break from the intense politics and diplomacy and always being on and available. Mark Smeaton had originally been part of the choir of Thomas Woolsey, and after Woolsey's downfall, he was transferred to the Tudor court. He was seen as a bit of a social climber. A later poem by Thomas Wyatt would talk about his social climbing, and there is record of Anne reprimanding him for thinking that she could speak to him and he could speak to her the, with the same familiarity that she spoke to members of the nobility. Still, his role was that of an entertainer. He provided an atmosphere of elegance and refinement within the Queen's private circle. William Brereton was older. He was born in 1490, so he was in his mid-40s at this point. Unlike many of Anne's courtiers, he was not known for his charm, but for his efficiency. As an experienced administrator, he managed legal matters, and the northern affairs for the crown. His presence at the court in 1535 was quieter than that of his more flamboyant peers, yet his influence was significant, particularly in discussions of land administration. This is during the dissolution of the monastery, so he was dealing with reclaiming the land. He was also involved in policy discussions, and he occasionally attended Anne's gatherings, but he was always businesslike. He was also married. He had married Elizabeth Somerset, who was a second cousin of Henry VIII. And in the summer of 1535, they had two children. He was always very businesslike and very efficient. And when he was accused later, he apparently was absolutely flummoxed because he said he had hardly ever even said as much as two words to Anne. So he was there to handle the serious parts of court life. He was valued for his expertise and his steadfast loyalty to the crown. Then we have Thomas Wyatt, the poet at court, the diplomat who had a very unique relationship with Anne Boleyn. We've done videos on their relationship. I'll link to them here. Their shared love of poetry and literature had roots going back to Anne's earlier years at court. They had known each other probably as children. By the summer of 1535, Wyatt was frequently found in Anne's literary circles contributing to the vibrant intellectual atmosphere that she fostered. His sonnets and his verses, often reflecting themes of courtly love, were popular at gatherings, providing a source of entertainment and subtle political commentary. And his interactions with Anne were marked by their mutual appreciation for the arts. In the summer of 1535, Anne Boleyn's court was the center of power, culture, and ambition. Poetry readings, musical performances, debates, and games filled the days creating an atmosphere of both sophistication and strategy. Without hinting at future events, this glimpse into the summer of 1535 reveals Anne's court at its cultural and political peak shaped by Anne and her circle of courtiers. So there we have it, a little bit about the men who were at Anne's court. We've done other videos on ladies-in-waiting, so I will link to those as well. If you made it to the end of this video and you enjoyed it, I sure would appreciate a press of that like button. It helps to feed the algorithm and get our videos to even more people and spread the tutor love. And I hope that I earned your subscription to my channel where I put out videos like this on the regular. Thank you so much for watching. Remember, you are deeply loved. I'm so glad I share the planet with you. And don't forget to drink your water. I will be back again very soon. Have an amazing day.